This is Brunswick, north of Melbourne City. It's a bit of a melting pot of hot pink cafes, Lebanese and Greek bakeries, shisha bars, bridal shops, the whole lot. I'm curious about suburbs, the history, migration and people that shape their streets. And Brunswick looked cool, so I flew there to check it out. I spoke to locals, like this guy Terry. While I was taking this clip, he struck a pose in the middle of the road, so I went up and said hey and found out he's lived in Brunswick for half a century. Then we got kicked out of the store for filming. Oh, and I tried local food. These two very generous Lebanese bakeries kept feeding me and would not accept my money. <laughs> I feel I won't leave until you let me pay. <laughs> I feel like really, really bad. There was this mix of the old and the new, and the two weren't at odds with each other. Love for the suburbs seemed communal from the eclectic community that formed inside it. <laughs> Brunswick is on the lands of the Wiradjuri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And this is the main street, Sydney Road. I walked up and down it for hours. Literally, I did 23,000 steps just on one road in one day. Turns out way back in the 1830s, this road used to run between a bunch of farming land. It became the main road to the gold mines and you guessed it, Sydney. See, I was doing a lot of reading into the history of the suburb, but got a little bit overwhelmed because there is a lot of it. So I reached out to the Brunswick Community History Group and Cheryl was able to help me out. I'm in Brunswick. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're back in 1839. We've got 16 big, big time landowners. They're all wealthy men. They're almost all English but they really weren't interested in being farmers and they pretty much sold their land. In the very first plan, the only road that was ever marked out was Sydney Road. And Sydney Road suddenly became more than just an access road for the farms because gold was discovered in, in um, the central gold fields. Everybody going up to the gold fields needed stuff. So it was a, it was a good place for businesses to start. So the hotels, started to do really good trade. <laughs> Someone told me the other day there was something like 30 or more um, pubs just along the Sydney Road bit. There were steel works, there were engineering works, there were rope works, there were, it was all industry. It was the potteries making the utilitarian products. It was the bluestone quarries. They, they were doing big business and the businesses themselves and the hotels and so on. And it pretty much, was working class uh, after the Second World War, so say the middle 1940s. Then things did change incredibly. A lot of um, Italians and Greeks came into the area immediately after World War II. And then there were Turkish people came in. Uh, and then in the 70s onwards, the Lebanese came into the mix. And then in the late 70s, after the fall of Saigon, 75, more some Vietnamese, but not so many. Um, and now, of course, we've got huge, huge mixes. That's when the good stuff started popping up. Restaurants, grocers, bakeries and shops started opening along Sydney Road. One of them, later in the 1990s, was A1 Bakery. Every single Melbourne local that I asked for food recommendations from said I have to eat at A1 Bakery. Great places like A1 Bakery. A1, obviously. A1 Bakery, I'm sure everyone says that. So I went and I am so glad I did. This is Haikal Raji, son of the owner of the family-run A1 Bakery. Uh, our family started this business in 1992 and it's been running ever since. Uh, there wasn't anything really around um, in the early 90s. The dining section was a lot smaller, um, but over the years we've expanded that and pushed our grocery section in a bit, so there's more room for dining. So A1 has been around for like 30 years, and what blew my mind was that dining section and who was sitting at the tables. See, the store was fitted out with traditional decorations, like flags and paintings of Lebanese saints. The store's owner painted that one. And all of the people working there were part of the family business. But it wasn't just Lebanese locals visiting for a taste of home. There were all sorts sitting in that dining section. Young people with cool mullets and adults with an army of children or older people with work laptops. Haikal thinks it's authentic food that brings different people together. It's just like good flavours of Lebanon. It was hard to find like, the flavours around Melbourne. I think that's what attracts people a lot. You can't go past the Zarka, of course. It's a 
it's aromatic but the smell and like the flavour is something that's not very common. Then I visited another highly recommended, if not as old, Brunswick establishment. Very good falafel. I spoke to co-owner Shulki, who opened the store six years ago with his business partner Louisa. My mum born in Iraq, in Baghdad, and my dad is from Romania, and I was born in Natania, Israel. This is the falafel that I know from home. He explained how the colour and the culture of the suburb came from this melting pot of migrants, both old and new. I think most of the people that cook in Australia, interesting food, weren't born here. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the shop owners have changed, so the, the signs have faded, but a lot of the shop owners are new immigrants still, you know? So it's just, it's, it's moving, it's changing, but it's still there. Like most of the people that cook around here do something that means something for them. Shuki was right. So many of the bakeries and cafes I was walking past and visiting were run by immigrants from all over. Like Robson Cardoso de Amarim, owner of Gloria Cafe. Uh, being Brazilian? Yes. Oh, it reflects on who I am and how I travel through life. He was saying how Brunswick itself shaped who he is and the food he serves. If you meet people, you take a little baggage with you and then you add your life. Right? I think that's the purpose of life. So here in the collecting bits and pieces, my food is homey and it's simple, it's plant based. My idea is just to bring people home and give, it's my way to give love and how I cook. So. And the diversity of it all seems to hit him too. Uh, blows my mind sometimes because I'm gonna have all oh my late 60s, 70s, 80s, I'll have very young people, I'll have tradies, some people just walking because it's colourful. Yeah, it's, sometimes it shocks me how, you know how actually diverse we can actually be without arguing anything. We are new, I know my regulars, I know them well. Community and family. I feel like everyone is hanging together. With new migrants moving into Brunswick, as well as new apartment buildings going up, and younger people like students choosing to live in Brunswick over other trendy suburbs close to the city, this suburb has seen a lot of change. Some people call this gentrification. Definitely a change uh, in the suburb. Uh, there's a lot more buildings and like uh, apartments going up, uh, which which is a good thing for business. But um, it, there, there were a lot of a lot more shops opened um, when I was younger. Uh, like there was a big fruit shop next door. There was a chicken shop next door, and there was a lot more going on in the street. Cheryl helped me understand this change. In the last ten years or so, I think to begin with, it was probably a bit edgy. You know, it was it was a bit cutting edge because very close to the city, very close to the um, university. I know gentrification is a funny word, isn't it? Because I don't think it's not grungification. Grungification. Yeah, well, I don't know whether it's an old fashioned word, but it's a bit hipster, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's a bit I like that. In the um, 80s and 90s, there was a change of uh, uh, change again because all those people who came as young married couples or young people, uh, all the Italians, the Greeks, the, the you know the post-war migrants were getting older, mm. so lots of people moved out to suburbs like Doncaster and so on, here, which are bigger bigger areas. And the funny thing is that now their kids are all coming. Everybody wants to come back in instead of having an aging population who are moving out. It, it's sort of um, empties out the, the culture that's there. There, are, it, there was a big group of young students, but lots of young couples with their families coming into the area. Lots of people with uh, an arts background, so music, um, you know, there's a really good vibe in that sense. But definitely changed, you know, it's, um, I think the essence of Brunswick is everyone's welcome. I think that's the first thing. Um, Everyone is feeling comfortable, be whatever they want to be, do whatever they want to do, be whoever they are here. Um, I think that's the core of it. And I think on top of it, there is like a layer that it just happened that everyone or a lot of people are uh, quite creative in the arts or in um, things like that. And that obviously makes things, make the suburb more interesting and, and fun, you know, and, and colorful and think that it's more creative and less 
depends on how much money you have to make fun here. And residents seem to agree too. Like Osman Faruqi, he's a Pakistani-born Australian journalist who has lived in Brunswick for about a year. I think this country, and particularly in big cities like Melbourne and Sydney, can be so segregated between those who have money and those who don't, and people who uh, can afford to live in certain areas and those who can't. So when you live somewhere that has a mix of everything, it's a reminder of like how diverse this country really is. It's sort of a suburb, I think, that has the best of what Melbourne can offer. It's close-ish to the city if you want to get there for work. It's also much more affordable than living in the city. But it has, like, it's a big suburb that has so many different parts to it. There's places where I live that are pretty gentrified because they're close to the wonderful Mary Creek, and they're close to tram lines, and they're full of <laughs> nice young white families. Uh, and then there are bits of it five, ten minutes down the road that are so multicultural. Turkish communities, Lebanese communities, Vietnamese communities, Greek communities. It's a suburb that you think should be out in the, you know, out much further away than it is, but it's so easy and accessible to get to. Walking down Sydney Road, you pass signs with faded Arabic writing and bridal shops and jewellers and fruit markets spilling out onto the street. The further down you walk that same road, the more those storefronts are replaced with colourful bars and bookshops, clothes stores and cafes. And locals from either end merge and blur and share the suburb, contributing to what it is today. I always get the feeling that, I always feel that the younger ones around here are looking out for us oldies. <laughs> I did really not. And we're looking out for them. We you all look out for each other and yeah. And um, that that's a nice feel, a real neighbourhood. It's really good to see, even though it was sad for ages when you see so many shop fronts closed because of, you know, lockdown fatigue and money running out and all that stuff. It was really nice to see so many different age groups, so many different nationalities. I think the openness and, and the fact that just everybody goes everywhere. So it's sort of that whole mixing melting pot, but it, it really is, it's exciting, I think. Is a real sense of neighbourhood, I think. Thank you for watching this brief history of Brunswick, Melbourne, told through the voices of the people in the neighbourhood today. I had a lot of fun making this one and it also took a lot of effort, including a whole plane ride from Sydney to Melbourne, so please be sure to leave a like on this video, comment your thoughts and if you have any feedback or criticism on how I can improve, and be sure to subscribe for my next video in this format and I will see you soon. Bye!